a super common refrain you'll hear from people against belief in the existence of God, especially according to the Christian conception of God, goes something like this. If my salvation, my eternal life, depends on belief or faith in God, and is therefore, you would assume, extremely important to him, he would obviously want me to believe in him. And the thing is, he could easily make himself known to me. He could simply appear to me, he could speak to me, he could perform some sort of sign or wonder that would convince me in a definitive way to let me know that he at least exists. And if he's all powerful, that wouldn't be very hard for him to do, but he doesn't do that. So he either can't, he's indifferent towards whether or not I believe in him, or he's simply not there. None of which is compatible with the Christian notion of God. Now, this is a pretty common atheistic argument, although I have heard some atheistic standard bearers like Richard Dawkins and uh, Peter Bogosian and uh, Peter Atkins admit that there's pretty much no evidence that they could they could possibly convince them that God actually does exist. Even if God wrote a message to them in the stars in the heavens, they would have to conclude that they had simply gone insane. In other words, their, their problem isn't that there is a lack of evidence or as we often hear that there's actually no evidence whatsoever. Their problem is that they won't admit any kind of possible evidence for the existence of God. For them, this is about a devotion and a commitment to a system of belief in certain enlightenment era presuppositions, not evidence. But for everyone else, for, for people who would be satisfied with some sort of evidence or some sort of encounter with God, I'd argue that there's another possible explanation for why God wouldn't reveal himself in such an explicit way. And since I would promote the Christian conception of God, it's important for us to understand what Christianity says about the larger context in here. Because if, if knowledge about God is an exchange between God presenting himself to us, if we're part of that equation, then we need to know something about ourselves. Christianity starts by telling us something about ourselves. It says that by our rebellion against God, we have adopted a condition that it sort of compromises our moral ability and our ability to know and understand what is good and true. And evidence of this compromised nature is everywhere. Just, just think about ignorance um, in general, because remember, there are plenty of facts and truths that are hidden from mine and your perception. You have to train your mind through education and study and the rehearsal of those things to begin to appreciate such truths and such facts. But just because they're hidden from your mind doesn't mean that they aren't there or that they don't exist or that they're inevitably completely inaccessible to you. It just means that something is preventing you from understanding until that something is remedied through knowledge or virtue or training. Another kind of proof of our own compromised nature might be found in this thought experiment. So if you found, let's say, a genie in a lamp who was willing to grant you any wish that you would wish for, um, what would it be? Now, you don't have to actually have to answer that, but we can imagine what most people would actually wish for. And I would say that it would be some sort of combination of our desires for wealth, honor, and power. That is to say that most people in wishing for these things by the, the endorsement of their wish would seem to agree that these are things that are worth having. These are things that we should strive for. And if the opportunity presents itself, we should go after them. In other words, they are good in and of themselves. And that's true. They are good in and of themselves. But when we possess them, something tends to go wrong, right? These things in human hands often seem to corrupt corrupt us and leave us feeling unfulfilled and, un and unsatisfied, if not worse. A common example that we often hear about is that of lottery winners who often end up going bankrupt shortly after they win because they didn't know how to manage such a sudden and dramatic undeserved influx of wealth. Look at all the celebrity class of millionaires who are constantly addicted to drugs, often overdosing on drugs, processing from one marriage to the next, seemingly never satisfied with the kind of life that most of us could only ever wish for. I remember seeing a, a quote from Jim Carrey, which I'm gonna have to paraphrase, but it went something like, um, I wish that most people could experience what it's like to be a rich celebrity, just so that they could know that it wouldn't solve all their problems. And I would add, it would actually create more problems. It's why we have platitudes like, there can be too much of a good thing. But I would adjust that to say that a good thing in the hands of your average human being often becomes 
a bad thing, which is only possible if something has gone wrong in us. Now, consider God as he is defined and proposed in Christian theology. He isn't just a good thing like wealth. He's the greatest of all things, for, for lack of a better phrasing there. To possess God in significant measures would likely produce destructive results for us as much as anything else, as we can see with other measures of wealth, honor, and power, all of which God possesses to the fullest. Fairly worn out analogy, which I've already alluded to, but it just works so well, so I'm going to rehearse it here again, is again related to human celebrity. Most people can admit that they are envious of the life of someone like, I don't know, let's say like a Taylor Swift, or if it's not Taylor Swift for you, then substitute who, who some great celebrity would be in your mind. But consider the fact that it's virtually impossible for someone like Taylor Swift to form an authentic new friendship with somebody. She can never make a new friend with someone who just cares about her as a person and not the celebrity and the power and the wealth associated with her. How could you untangle that in order to just love her for who she is and what she is? And this is the dilemma we encounter when we consider just a human celebrity, which is only a slightly better looking and more talented version of you and I. But God is infinitely superior to us. And according to Christian theology, God doesn't just want us to believe that he exists to admit the fact of his being. He wants us to know and love him, to be in some sort of an intimate relationship with him to some degree. But if God just dropped the curtain on you one night and gave an exhibition of his glory and his splendor, how do you think you'd react to that? Would that be the instigation of a loving, intimate relationship? Because love for it to be meaningful, for it to endure beyond uh, fleeting emotions or passions, it has to be an act of, of the will, not some sort of Pavlovian compulsion. If God simply appeared to you, his splendor would be so overwhelming and intoxicating that you would simply fall on your face in a state of terrified paralysis right after pooping your own pants. And something tells me that those aren't the ingredients for like a loving relationship. If God was petty and insecure like the pagan gods were, or at least the way that they're depicted in their own histories, maybe he would just show off so that we would simply compulsively worship him, but he shows restraint against producing that kind of effect. Ah, but I can already hear the voice of polemicists like Richard Dawkins say, but God is petty and insecure. Haven't you ever read the Old Testament? And that's a great point. So let's talk about the Old Testament because God seems a little bit more, I don't know, like totalitarian in the Old Testament, right? So the Old Testament tells the many varied stories about how God reveals himself to a certain people in order to make them into like a holy nation, which means a nation set apart from the rest of the world so that they can know and worship the one true God. Um, and that eventually from among them, he would instigate the reconciliation or the salvation of all mankind. And that nation eventually became known as the Israelites. But if you're familiar with the story of how he claims them and delivers them out of slavery, you'll notice that God makes himself pretty explicitly known to them. The relationship that the Israelites have with God isn't one of mere faith. Instead, it's one of a pretty explicit experience of God's presence. He performs several signs and wonders to prove to him that he is God and that he chose them to be his people. He parts the Red Sea, something so unimaginably impressive that how could you do anything but tremble in worship towards the one that performed such a feat? Then after they escape out of Egypt, they find themselves walking through the wilderness um, with God in the form of like this flaming pillar of fire that's leading the way. At another point, he descends on a mountain as an ethereal cloud and such a terrifying display of his presence that the people, they were too afraid to even go near it. He feeds them with food that just appears from heaven every morning. And then he eventually defeats all of their enemies so that they can inherit the promised land that he, he told them about. So God was as explicitly present to them as he could be. But think about what that does to the dynamic of that relationship between God and the Israelites. Because once God is fully known, we have no excuse for disobeying him. If knowing and following God is largely an encounter with mystery and experimentation with applying his teachings, then we can be somewhat excused for making mistakes along the way, right? But if God is more fully known to us and explicitly gives us instructions and commandments, well, 
at that point, we don't really have an excuse for disobeying. And in fact, any act of disobedience at that point is a pretty explicit act of rejection and rebellion towards him. Like imagine a job that you just got hired at and your boss gives you clear and unambiguous instructions. Do this, don't do that, get it done in this amount of time, etc. And none of what he directs you in is, is unrealistic beyond what you're capable of. Now imagine if after being hired and given such explicit instruction, on a daily basis, you just disregarded those instructions and disobeyed him. What what could he re what should he reasonably do with that? I think most reasonable people would say that he would be justified in firing you for that. But now imagine if you fell short or you transgressed some expectations of your employer, but without knowing it was explicitly against his wishes. He may inform and correct you, but your culpability would be significantly reduced in light of what you knew and what you did not know. So according to the New Testament conception of faith, faith is belief in things unseen. There is this tinted glass that we look through to encounter and to know God. And by that slight separation and, and sort of mystery and ambiguity, our encounter with him is made a little bit more gradual, uh, more gentle, if you will. This is, a most, this is most profoundly communicated to us in the incarnation of Jesus, in which we encounter God but with his splendor hidden in human form. And I would argue that this is probably why the Israelites in the Old Testament were handled in a bit more of a severe manner when they rebelled against him, which they did over and over again. For them, they couldn't claim that they didn't really know God's will or feign ignorance of the reality of his, his presence to them or his instruction. He had revealed himself as explicitly and as dramatically as he possibly could. And yet that still wasn't enough for them to follow his instructions. Their rejection of him couldn't be blamed on ambiguity on God's part. It could only be blamed on naked rebellion and contempt for the one true God, making their crime that much more severe and therefore the consequences likewise. This is why faith in the dynamic of our relationship with God is more like a mercy and sort of a gentle way for us to interact with him. It's something that God initiates in us and then we respond to in trust of him and through those kinds of daily exchanges rehearsed over and over, a conversion of heart and mind takes place in us. Just like any training does, if you worked out for an hour every day, eventually over time, you would become more fit and not only more fit, but more able to perform feats that fitness can accommodate. Faith is described in the Christian tradition as a virtue in the same way. And a virtue is a stable disposition to do good formed by habit, by the repetition of doing good things. As long as we continue to respond to God's invitation, we will come to know him more and more explicitly as we become more ready to know him in greater measure as opposed to just the, the small dosage that he gives us at the beginning. And simultaneously, we will also be more accountable for that knowledge. That's why Jesus says to those who are given much, much will be expected from them. So he doesn't just reveal himself fully from the first interaction because we would never be ready to respond to such an exposition in a way that wouldn't just jeopardize our sanity and our well-being. If you're a Catholic who is a leader in your profession and you're like me, you probably had some desire for more opportunities to network with other Catholic professional leaders in order to help each other grow professionally, spiritually, and economically. Because this is exactly what we're doing with Fisher's Network. We're mobilizing Catholic professionals and economic leaders into local crews so that they can better support one another in the hopes of building up something like a local Catholic economy. As they do so, they can better support their parish in a variety of ways. Imagine as a parish having a group of experts you can turn to for advice and support on business decisions that have to be made. This is why pastors participate in our crews as well. They get business mentorship while having the opportunity to build up leaders in their community. So if this sounds like a way to strengthen your local Catholic community or parish, consider becoming a member by visiting fishersnetwork.com.